Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. If you've been blessed by our podcast, please prayerfully consider partnering with us on Patreon. Your support will help cover the cost to produce the podcast, but will also give you access to exclusive content like monthly reflections and special live stream teachings. Go to patreon.com slash restore the glory and join the mission of experiencing the restoration of our God-given glory. Hey, Bob, good to be back with you once again. Um, doing okay today? Doing good. Excited for our guest today. I am as well. Uh, so listeners, you have a special guest today. Jackie Mulligan from Reform Wellness is with us. We are in obviously a series on healing and leadership. And Jackie, I am really excited to welcome you. Uh, you are the foundress and CEO of Reform Wellness, so website reformwellness.co. And that is a functional medicine and holistic wellness practice rooted in Christ. And I have to say that I've heard all kinds of amazing things about you. This is really cool to be able to sit with you face to face. And I just want to start off by saying I'm so grateful that the physical wellness and health is being, I don't know what I'd call it, reclaimed by the church in some ways. Like I'm usually, right, you go to Dr. Oz or whoever the guy is at the time. So to be like, no, this is this is the church. And I love on your website, your, your pictures there with a group of CFRs, it looks like, or seminarians yeah. or something. They're all bald-headed and big beards, so that's usually a sign <laughs> of a CFR. But <laughs> yeah, anyway, so Jackie, thanks so much for being with us. Welcome. We're so glad to have you. Well, thank you so much, Jake. And thank you, Dr. Bob. Thanks be to God for this invitation and a gift to, to do this, this work, um, really to carry out this mission. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself, like just maybe a little bit about yourself, the ministry, and um, uh, I'm assuming you call it a ministry because it's, it's what we would call it. I'm sure you call it the same. Yeah, it's absolutely a ministry. It's an apostolate, and um, we, we call it both and. You know, we look at the, yeah. the both the body and the soul. We're, we're a business and a ministry, um, hmm. and um, we are a, a team of creatives, educators, functional medicine practitioners, doctors. Um, from mm -hmm. all walks of life, from all over the globe, um, who carry out this desire to um, put Christ at the center of our entire lives. And so mm -hmm. um, I started Reform officially three years ago, um, just actually three years ago, but uh, wow. the Lord had Reform in my heart for probably forever. Um, but uh, I had my own uh, reformation, if you will. Um, in 2015 and 2016, um, I was always a practicing Catholic, but I had a, a real conversion of heart um, during a very hard time. I was, uh, on paper, everything looked like it was going really, really well. Um, I was um, running national sales for a startup company, a Scandinavian um, supplement company. I was their first employee and, and climbed very quickly to the top of, of the ladder. Um, I was going back to school um, for functional health and, um, and holistic healing. Um, and then I was also kind of at a transition point in, in a relationship where I wasn't sure if, if it was going to the next level or if, if this was uh, what we're, the, the Lord was calling me. Um, but at the same time of all this happening, I also felt really uh, sick. Um, so I was just before that, I loved CrossFit. Uh, some may say I drank the Kool-Aid, if you will, um, oh, and uh, did some competing, but I really just loved uh, loved it so much. Um, I loved the, the competitive um, atmosphere and, and, the, and, the, and the constant challenge. Um, and I... I kind of got lost in all of the striving. You know, I was striving to wow. um, be the the best at work. I was striving to be the best in athletics. I was striving to um, to do well uh, in school, and then I was striving even in my family. I'm I'm one of seven. I'm an aunt to uh, to many nieces and nephews, and um, I also wanted to be the the best daughter and the best sister and the best aunt, um, all with really good wow. intention, um, but just just too much spread really too too thin. And, um, I got Lyme's disease and it was really humbling, um, because I, uh, I started to really be limited in my ability, uh, physically, um, mentally, emotionally, 
and spiritually. And um, just everything felt harder and like it needed more attention and more energy. Um, And it took um, watching one of my older sisters go through a really difficult life trial um, and handle it with such grace um, and and really deep faith in the Lord. It was watching her example that gave me the courage to say, okay, maybe this isn't the best relationship for me. And maybe this isn't the best job for me. Um, Mm. And maybe the way that I'm living actually isn't the best way for me. Mm. Um, And my sister invited me to pray a holy hour every day um, to, to kind of start my, my healing journey in this like new way of life. And um, that led to many hours in prayer each day and slowly but absolutely surely allowing Christ to be at the center of my entire life. Um, The center of my closet, the center of my relationships, the center of my plate, the center of my workouts, um, the center of my thoughts. And that was the beginning of me realizing that if I wanted to be well, he needed to be at the center. And if I wanted to help other people be well, they also needed to have him at the center. Wow. I, I love Jackie, the even the diagram of all the different areas of life and the monstrance and Jesus being in the center of that, it really captures it. And you know, we do healing the whole person conferences, but it's like we deal with the past woundedness and the way that it manifests. But I you're really dealing with healing the whole person in the present moment. And hmm. uh I, I just have always felt, even before we met, a a kinship to what you're doing. Thank you, Dr. Bob. It's the the, the pillars um, that we have at Reform uh, are all different areas of of our well being. Um, everything from nutrition and sleep to stress and play and personal growth and community. Um, right. But Reform was really born um, in in adoration, and that's why the pillars are are shown in in the shape of a monstrance, um, because. Mm-hmm. Truly, everything does have to stem from Christ at the center. Um, and mm-hmm. so that really is what gives us a, a purpose. Um, mm-hmm. When I was working uh, with with lots of lay people in the world, when I first started my own nutrition practice, um, I noticed this common trend of more is more. You know, how healthy can I eat? I want to eat even cleaner. And how heavy can mm-hmm. I lift? I want to lift even more. Um, Mm -hmm. And how well can I uh, manage my productivity because um, I want to be, you know, even more um, productive during the day and and manage stress better. Um, Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when that runs out, we're still hungry for more and the world is like more and more and we get there and that's really empty. So we go to another category and we want more and more there. So this is Mm -hmm. really what gave me the courage to realize like, okay, Jesus needs to be at the center of my life, but also those who, who I'm helping. And so when he becomes the why and he becomes the purpose, it's actually that we require less. And then we don't kind of keep striving because the why is all about something else and not about, about the world. So it's now building your plate because of Jesus and not because we want to eat as clean, cleaner than we did the day before, or, you know, we want to be a certain pant size or dress size. Um, But the why becomes, well, no, I want to nourish my body with food to make me feel fully alive so I can be alive for Christ and serve Mm -hmm. and glorify him through, through this body. So the, the pillars really help us to define our why so we can keep Christ at the, at the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm, holding the horses back, I guess, as you (laughs) could say, because I'm just like, Jackie, you have listed so many things that I'm interested in from some things I'm more interested than others, but okay, I'll give you a little snapshot. It just went went through my head. Jackie would know about ideal supplements. Is it good to take vitamin D? How much? (laughs) To CrossFit, striving. I totally get it. I love CrossFit, but man, it can kick your butt and then you don't like doing it anymore and you don't sleep well. And What's a good workout routine? I bet Jackie's heard of Kin Stretch. I know about Kin Stretch, this functional movement. I was just like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's just so many cool things that you're talking about that. I, and and I have to say the heart of everything is what I love is the idea to not have to throw the stuff of the world out, but to redeem it. And I'm hearing you say that with Christ at the center, right? I don't have to be afraid. 
and I can transform my life. And I, it, it, I can, you know, I'm kind of reading between the lines. Like you are going into areas that are notoriously um, anti-religion, I guess I would say. Like typically wellness and health is like God is not part of that, you know. Um, so I just love it as a frontier of of kind of reclaiming the fullness of what it means to be a Christian, a son or daughter of God and Christ at the center. There's just, man, there's so much um, that's exciting about what you're saying. So I don't even know what the next question should be because I'm like, okay, right, the podcast were about leadership, but I'm already interested in a thousand other things that you're talking about. So <laughs> if we have time, maybe I'll circle back around to that. But um, one of the things that we're trying to address in the series is leadership, brokenness, healing, et cetera, and leadership. So I guess I'm just curious to the degree that you're comfortable sharing, like how has your brokenness affected your leadership? Because let, let's just acknowledge you're a major leader now in in this uh, sphere. Uh, I know a lot of people I know reference you, mm -hmm. and I think that's fantastic. Um, and so because of that, how has your brokenness affected your leadership and how has your healing mm. affected your leadership? Could you walk us into that? Yeah, sure. And these, these were, I'm, I'm so glad I had a little bit of time to pray about these questions because these are big, these are big questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I really invited the Lord into, um, you know, any holes that, that I may have experienced from other leaders and, and even as a leader myself, um, one thing that I love that you and Dr. Bob shared was that um, leading seems like it's a it's a privilege and that like you're really powerful, but it's actually revealed more of my weaknesses and humbled me in ways um, that I have never ever imagined. Um, mm. I have two incredible parents, my mom and dad, um, parents to mm. to seven, and um, I mean they provided in ways that I. I couldn't even have dreamed of and worked really, really hard, um, to support all of us mm. and give us a really beautiful, uh, life and, um, and really the essence of family, like really helped us understand like the importance of, of family. And, mm. um, I, I learned, um, how to work really hard, <laughs> uh, from their example, um, which is really, really beautiful. Uh, but I, I kind of lost my way a bit, um, when, uh, I think because I'm number six of seven, um, you know, mm. sometimes to be seen and, and, and sometimes to, to get a word in, like you, you have to strive and accomplish. And that striver really came out in me. Um, and I think as a leader came out to other people who worked for me mm. where it's like, Oh, wow. You know, Jackie has it all together and Jackie's capable and, and Jackie's striving. So therefore if I work for her or with her, I have mm. to strive and I have to have it all together and I have to have it all figured out. Um, and even through my healing, um, when I relied more on the Lord and not myself, I don't know how well I was showing that example, you know? And so it's, it's funny because I kind of slowly in starting reform made that shift from reliance on myself to reliance on the Lord, but I still looked like I had it all together. And like, I did, I don't know that I necessarily needed him. And so, um, that was kind of a, an interesting experience of, of taking the the example of my parents as incredible leaders, but realizing that um, I actually like, I thought that rest was a trophy um, for a job well done, um, rather well than this essential gift that the Lord gives us, um, whether we earn it or, or, or not. <laughs> um, yes. And so I, I think that's, that's kind of one to, to start. Hmm. That's why I hear in your story where the, if you will, the rubber hit the road, where, where the conversion started in the place of the drivenness as opposed to learning how to balance and rest. And so you share a little bit more about that, if you will. Yeah, you know, I thought that um, if I was going to succeed um, in the world, that that meant that I had to work nonstop and, and strive and, and, um, and earn it. Um, and so that led to being sick and, um, and really my whole, my whole person was compromised. Um, you know, I, I was maybe mm -hmm. physically uh, again, looked really, really healthy, but, um, there was anxiety and there was, um, spiritual doubt and, um, 
And, you know, I, I think really deep down what I was striving for was to be seen, but like I was being seen by the people who loved me and I was being seen um, by the world in a very real way. I wasn't really allowing the the Lord to see me or maybe even the people that I love close, uh, that, that I love the most and the people that are closest to me to really see me because I was very far away from me, um, even doing really good work, even with good intention. Um, and not really knowing what this um, hardness or haste was really rooting from um, until I learned how to how to be still. Hmm. Jackie, can I ask where you grew up? Like what uh, what part of the country did you in the U.S.? I grew up uh, in New York on Long Island. Oh, wow. OK, <laughs> so just culturally, in some ways, when I think about I, I, I'm not a city guy. I grew up on farms and, and stuff like that. And so when I think about New York, I get anxious just thinking about <laughs> it, <laughs> right? Not alone. Like you put me in Vancouver, which is not far and it's a pretty busy, busy city. It's nothing like New York and Heather. I'm like, Heather, you got to drive because I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. Did, I guess the, in that, I'm hearing you describe your environment and the impact of your environment. And there was like a culture almost of striving. And I imagine your parents didn't intentionally like sit everybody down and go, you're working hard or you're all no. losers, right? That was mm -hmm. not, it was like implied. Is that yeah, it was implied. You know, we grew up in the suburbs um, in a really beautiful house um, and really close to lots of extended family as well. Um, wow. And so the uh, the culture was was really beautiful and tight. Um, and also mm. there was this expectation um, to to work hard and and um, mm -hmm. but to do well uh, and in a, in a very realistic yeah in a very realistic way, but also in a way that. Uh, invited you to really uh, do your best. And so it was, you know, if you're, if you're going to go to college, you know, you have to work as hard as you can to, to get a scholarship uh, or to get in a school that's realistic for, um, you okay. know, a family who has this many, this many kids um, right. and also to, to help each other um, and, um, hmm. and just be able to really uh, come alive in the sense of who you are. So like one of my skills was really like the, the helped the helper. Um, I okay. was really good at um, kind of coming in, adapting to environment um, and, and helping whoever, whoever needed it. So I think sometimes um, that may have translated as a distraction for me to focus on my own healing. Um, I moved mm -hmm. to California um, in 2012. It was my first real time being away from, from home. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking like, I don't even know if I really know who I am, like outside of my, wow. my family. And the right. chaos was really because there was just so many people, you know, and, and sure. um, that was the beauty of it uh, is that yeah. there was always something going on. There was so always something to do. Um, right. And I think in a lot of ways uh, that was a huge blessing. And in some ways um, it, again, it may have distracted um, me or some of us from, from like kind of knowing ourselves or understanding some, um, some healing that needed to be done. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So how did the healing process uh, start to take hold and, and begin to shift things for you? Yeah. Um, prayer, <laughs> adoration. Um, the Lord saved me in adoration, truly. Uh, hmm. It was this, these very small invitations to say yes to him. So like instead hmm. of the threat of, I have to convert my whole life, which is this lie of the evil one. Um, it was the Lord's like wow. gentle nudge to say, these small yeses are going to add up to one big yes. So like, where can you start small and just give me one yes at a time? Amen. And that felt achievable to me. Um, so in adoration, I started to realize um really my purpose and my, my primary identity, which is the same that you both share with me is that we're daughters and sons of Christ. And when there's like this piece that came with that of like, I don't have to do or be anything else. Like my primary purpose is to be a daughter of Christ. And when I really sat with that, I mean, we can, we can meditate on that for, for years, <laughs> um, yeah. but really just sitting with that, that really allowed me to reclaim my healing um, my identity and my purpose totally in, 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 mm. in Christ. Um, and that, that kind of made me again, hungry for more because every yes gave me more freedom. And I thought that the world was where I got the freedom. You know, I was living in, in San Diego. I had, you know, it's like perpetual vacation there. And, yeah. um, I, I thought I had all the freedom that, that I needed. 
Um, but actually the freedom, the more and more I said yes to the Lord, the freedom was really found in him and it needed to be done in subtle, uh, and small ways, but then also in, in pretty, pretty big ways. Wow. You're describing Jackie, I think something that's such, um, a common trap, but I think the world that you're in and bringing Christ into, to me, is one of the most obvious worlds where we find our identity apart from God, right? So take uh, athletics, physical health, physical appearance. In some ways, it's all this stuff that if I work harder, I could control it and I can see results. And so I don't have to depend on somebody else. I can do it. It's very self-reliant. I think those themes are riddled throughout every dimension and aspect of life. I mean, that's the garden. That's the fall. It was rooted Mm -hmm. in self-reliance, not God-reliance. But what's so interesting is that you're describing these domains that are notorious, like they're, they're top of list when you come to, you know, like the fitness world, just as an example. So many people... I'm doing a bit of stereotyping. I've worked with several people on a professional level in that industry, and they just talk about how vain it can get and how their identity is found in simply how they look. Not even in what they do, but they have to do a lot to look a certain way. And then they literally can, in some instances, go on a stage be assessed for how they look, and then they're validated or not validated. Mm -hmm. And I just go, what a mind bender of an experience. And I just think I really want to emphasize that for our listeners and for us as well, identity being found in Christ versus identity found in all these other criteria. Because I think that for me, I'll speak for me, it's one of those illusions that I fall into of um, if I work harder in the gym uh, at my eating or whatever, then I'll be lovable. And then I have this evidence to prove my lovability. And But I can't keep up the the striving that's required to always meet the next standard. It's like it's debilitating. Uh, so and as an example, a guy I go to for physio, uh, just really love him. Um, he has a very... I think you guys would really get along, right? He's not very limited. He's not just like, give me your knee. Let me crack it. And you'll be better, right? There's a bit, it's a bit more than that. No, no, no I'm not trying to come against chiropractors or anything. I'm just using an example. But he says to me when, cause we, I, I've been injured repeatedly and in working out. And he said, Jake, when you're working out, are you punishing yourself or are you trying to bless yourself? And I was floored by that question because I was, I had to be honest, 80, 90% of the time. It was punishment to to make up for something I did wrong so that I could get back to some standard or whatever. I could prove myself. If I can deadlift this much, then that means this. Like, what a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing you touch all in those domains. Is is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. We, We purposely have our pillar named functional movement and not exercise because exercise has this connotation of punishment. Um, and so we invite um, people who who are are healing through reform to look at even functional movement through the lens of Christ and saying, how can I move my body to glorify the Lord? And, and wow. how do I move my body in a way that I actually truly enjoy? So what's going to mm. be life-giving to me when I move my body in a way um, that actually doesn't cause more pain or isn't rooted from a place of punishment or shame um, or regret? And it's really beautiful because somehow we think if I don't have an hour to sweat, you know, profusely in in my Lululemons, then I I shouldn't work (laughs) out today. Um, But then if you change the lens to, oh, um, I'm I'm moving my body to glorify the Lord. It's like suddenly I I want to go on a walk. I I, I want to move. I I get to, um, you know, lift today. That yeah. changes everything. And that's, again, why we have the monstrance, because it's, again, it's rooted to Christ. So I'm moving my body with a different purpose. Yeah, I, I love how your healing came from sitting and doing nothing, quote unquote, <laughs> uh, but being present to mm. the one who is present to you. And that that in itself shifts the whole picture. Uh, you know, adoration for me is one place where you just go and you just you just be. I mean, there's nothing. Yeah. I mean, you can do. I've tried to bring doing into my adoration. It doesn't work either. But just yeah, me too. <laughs> just just being there yeah. and being with him 
shifts the whole dynamic. And, uh, you know, I, I think back to my own sports in high school and college and then afterwards and then that drivenness that I've got to run marathon and I didn't never ran marathon, but I've got to run cross country and I got to train and I, you know, you just push and push and push and push and you lose the enjoyment mm-hmm. of the exercise. You lose your environment. And now my morning walks are prayer. And, you know, I, I pray the Lord who is everything seen and unseen. And I look around and I see everything and I feel everything. And it's just such a shift mm-hmm. in exercise. And so I'm relating to what you're describing there in that process. It's it's just such a fundamental shift. Mm. Mm. One one of the, the biggest uh, things I noticed in, in adoration, um, when I uh, had this, this invitation t- for Jesus to reform my life, was really understanding Mary's fiat. And I remember looking at yeah. Mary like, okay, you need to be my example here. Um, mm. Because because he chose you and asked a really big thing of you and like, how did you do it? And, you know, as a woman, especially relating to Mary, um, Mm. it's the greatest gift. It really is just Mm. the greatest Mm. gift. And I thought about her fiat, um, and how she let it be done Mm. and not forced it to be done, Mm. um, Mm. or made it be done, but just let it be done. And that was really for me, the first piece of surrender and really allowing the Lord to let it, to, to do it for me. Um, yeah. I mean, Exodus 14, 14, uh, is, is my, you know, my go-to verse. Um, let the Lord fight for you. You need only to be still. Mm. Um, the peace that comes with that of just <laughs> <laughs> being still and allowing him to, to, to do it. Um, that, mm. that is trust. Um, and that is, that's grace. That is, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and really even it's, it's this beautiful acceptance in a lot of ways of the humility of it, receiving his mercy and, um, and love saying, you're going to, you're going to do this for me. I don't, I don't have Mm -hmm. to earn this. I don't have to Mm -hmm. figure this out. Wow. Yeah. I, I, that is so good. Let it be done. Cause there's where the carryover uh, and I, I, Sorry, again, there's so many th- things going on in my head. Um, the let it be done is the antidote to striving, right? And striving in the uh, spiritual life can be dangerous. And yet, effort is required. A guy I regularly reference just in my life because I appreciate his insights into the world is a, a guy named Dallas Willard. And he says, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Mm-hmm. Earning is an attitude. It's a way of the heart versus effort is something that's inherent. And, and what I think I'm hearing you imply here is it still required showing up at adoration. Mary still had to say yes, because I think the the misleading thing that I can struggle with, and I, I again, maybe this is universal, is I'm always on the pendulum of going, work my tail off. <laughs> sit in my bedroom in the dark all day and don't do anything. (laughs) Okay, that didn't work. And I never, I'm trying to find that sweet spot in the middle of, okay, I do have to engage. But if my attitude and engaging, right? Like Bob, you still walk. But if you're walking to earn, that's very different than walking to be with, Mm -hmm. you know? And so there's this nuance here. Jackie, your whole ministry is about healing. I mean, it's similar to like Bob and I's work. It's not hard to see how you're trying to bring about healing in other people. And I, I've, I know through the grapevine and just through the things that I've heard, you're working a lot with leaders. Like you do a lot of work with leaders. And I, one of the domains that I, a lot of priests li- listen to our podcast, some bishops listen to our podcast. Uh, could you just for a moment, like, I'm assuming any priest and bishop could go through the reform kind of the program and the mm-hmm. system and all that. So could you maybe give a little bit of a synopsis of what somebody's looking at when they come to you? So, cause I know what, here's what a priest will do. I work a lot with priests. Bob works a lot with priests. They'll go, I don't have the time. <laughs> I can't cook. Um, I try to pray, but I've got all this other stuff, right? So I'm, I'm just, man, I long for those guys to be really healthy and well. So just anything you'd say there. 
Yeah, uh, so much. Um, the gift of of moving back to New York in in uh, 2017 um, was meeting Father Innocent Montgomery and and reconnecting with Father Joe Fitzgerald. And um, these were two priests um, that both recognized um, that their need for reform. Um, I was in a season where my body was physically healthier, and um, but my soul uh, needed needed some work. And they were in a season where their souls were radiant, um, but but need, their bodies were were broken down from from mm. the um, their service to to the Lord and to the church. Um, mm. In my work through um, through helping them, you know, we we started off thinking, okay, there's a lot of focus on nutrition, which you know, especially the CFRs, they can't really control most of it. Everything, you know, <laughs> donated and, and, you know, yeah. you, their, their vow of poverty doesn't exactly allow for, for, um, specialty meals. Right. Um, but when we looked at their stress and their sleep and, um, their, mm. uh, re- interaction with community or lack thereof, um, right. and their movement or lack thereof, uh, and saw that actually there was a lot of pieces to the puzzle that really weren't in place but um, that they were lacking in their own leadership because they were not well. There were some major holes in their, in right. their, in their overall well-being. And so helping them um, and then watching them heal uh, yeah. was tremendous for me because I realized that reform is, is for, for everyone. And, and one of the things you, you said um, a couple of, uh, in the intro to, to this series was that, you know, everyone's a leader. And I was really thinking about it, that, and I and I was thinking that's a very similar to what I realized when I was starting reform is that wholeness and holiness is for everyone. It's not, mm. you know, holiness is not just for religious and priests, and wholeness is not just for for lay people. But we are all called to be whole, and we're all called to be holy. Mm. Um, and in that way, we need an ordered life. You know, formation is not just for seminarians and priests and and religious. Amen. You know, we all need a formation. Um, you know, I learned from the from observing the friars that um, were either formed or deformed by the mm-hmm. world or God. You know, and so it's like, what are you going to choose to really let you f- to form you? And that means living in an intentional way. Um, so, unfortunately, um, I think that our leaders in in the church are completely burnt out and and uh, stretched thin, and they don't mm-hmm. have um, enough time to really take good care. And so. Mm-hmm. Um, taking the time to understand how food does affect um, your homilies and your prayer life um, and your energy. Um, taking time to understand that sleep is essential and not um, and not a, a luxury <laughs> that you get on the one day that you uh, you actually sleep in because you're you're so tired. But really understanding that your you know taking care of yourself uh, is really going to be what pours out to everybody that. Um, that they do serve. Uh, Father Instant shares in, in his testimonial um, that's on our website that when mm. he um, when he started eating better and getting to the root cause of of some of the um, symptoms he was experiencing, um, what he was feeding his body was resulting in what he was feeding the people that he was preaching to. And so wow. all of a sudden, you know, the words uh, and the wisdom came so much more easily because his body wasn't working as hard to to support his um, his intense output. So there are a lot of avenues uh, for for reform to to help, um, especially priests and, and religious. Um, but I think it's starting with saying um, this investment is for my whole person. This investment is is for my body, for my mind, for my soul, but it's actually also for my ministry. It's the investment in in the gift of self, um, which is what a leader is, um, to be mm-hmm. able to invest into my well-being so that I can give to others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let, let me wrestle with you a little bit there because yeah, I, let's do I, it. Can, I can hear, I, I, first of all, I wholeheartedly agree, but I can hear some who have been brought up into the church with the model of the saints you know, and you you read about the mm. hair shirts and the sleeping on the hard surfaces, and the, you know, and and it's created as like this heroic virtue. Okay, we'll die at twenty five, but this life isn't important. What what's important is the next life. So, how do you mm. combat that barrier, if you will, mm. uh, to quote unquote holiness, which again is just a performance, another performance standard of this is what it means to be holy. Yeah, no, it's it's something we come up against a lot, and it's a really great it's a really great question, um, and and something to discern very seriously. 
we use St. Augustine's approach of treat, take care of your body as if you're going to live forever and your soul as if you're going to die tomorrow. So we're looking at, at the both end uh, together in that. And I think that um, when our mission is, is clearly given to us, um, you know, we have to tend to the things that, that we can control and that are important. So I'll take, um, for, for example, the CFRs who do have a vow of poverty. Um, you know, we're not putting so much emphasis on supplements and fancy food and protocols. We're looking at their way of life. You know, what, where, what are ways we can control to reduce your stress so that your body doesn't have to work as hard to break down food or to detoxify and things of this nature. So it's more so looking at the uh, factors we can control um, that don't have to always translate as the world uh, glorifies self-care and glorifies, you know, all the uh, the extras. Um, sometimes it's, it's actually instead of more, which we think in, in um, the world of, of health and um, and again, self-care, but it's, it's, it's most of the time, Dr. Bob, it's less and it's, it's simplifying so that, um, you know, sleeping on the floor actually isn't going to uh, affect your health that much because the, it's not another added stressor in, in, um, in the mm. grand scheme of things. Oh, that's good. Wow. Yeah. I, again, I'm hearing the in, engage, but perform is not the goal engage with the right mindset and uh, you're you're alluding to something there about you know the integration that happens in healing and and bob you and i know that from the psychological point of view if we start to do trauma therapy with somebody and they are um a mother of seven let's just say you know to use the pertinent example that can wreck their entire life right you have to be sensitive with the depths and degrees that you go and work with the normal things and yeah, I think that I'm really hearing you, Jackie, say that reform doesn't come in and go. It's not like the boot camp where we're stripping you of everything and you're going down to a T-shirt and shorts and that's it. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. like I'm there's a because this is I, I can assume that because, you know, Christ and I do as well. And that's not his style when he's transforming people. And, Bob, I think that's to your point is a lot of this goes back to the impression we have of God. And then that impression steps right into the healing process that we enter into. So if God's a saint maker, well, then that means he's a cruel drill sergeant like you see in the movies who just is yelling and go through the mud and all that kind of stuff because you'll come out the other end a superhero like Padre Pio or whatever. And that impression of God is really huge. And I'm hearing, Jackie, you're implying that God is kind, God is attentive, God cares, but he's not reckless in the sense of he's not Im imprudent. I, don't, I mean that mm -hmm. generically, right? He's not um, wild. I'm just thinking, sorry, my head's like counteracting like, well, Jake, there is that song, Reckless Love. And a lot of people think that's a great <laughs> song. That's not, what, that's, not, that's not what I'm trying to say, right? People like take, take things literally, but the nuance I'm trying to make is... Um, the impression we have of God informs the journey of healing. And I, and I think what's beautiful is I'm hearing about your impression of God through how you engage in the healing process and ask leaders to engage in it as well. What, one quick question. We're referencing this monstrance and pillar thing. Can you explain what is that and what does that mean and how does that fit in reform? Sure. Yeah. So we redeform, uh, we redefine health as a state of your body and soul together, and we use the nine pillars to define your your health. So faith okay. is at the is at the center, and then there's eight other pillars that go around. So it's nutrition and sleep, stress management, functional movement, personal growth, play, space, and community. And that's hmm. how we uh, define health. And so it's no longer um, just about if you got your workout in or, you know, how, how clean you ate, um, but it's about uh, your relationships with other people, your relationship with the Lord. Um, wow. It's about, uh, it is, of course, about your nutrition and, and your sleep, but it's, it's, it's so much more than that. So right. what we basically do is we, we look at our health like, um, like a bank account in the sense of uh, asking people to assess the current state of their body and their soul and what they do uh, each day and each week to, um, to make deposits uh, that are life-giving rather mm. than um, withdrawals that are life-detracting. And when you have a, an, um, an idea of the state of your body and the state of your soul um, each day, uh, each, each week, each month, Think about the way that you would live if you knew that you're entering into a Monday uh, at a five out of a 10, 
and that you needed some uh, some deposits for your body, like you're going to make mm. intentional choices using the pillars to to um, become more healthier uh, or to and to have a, a fuller account um, by by the end of the week. And so if you it's it's all about like this uh, this awareness. And so the pillars give us um, tools and also uh, uh, different ways to redefine our our health so that um, we're looking at all aspects and not just limiting it to what the world may define us as health. Mm. Yeah, I, I love it. I, what here's an impression I have, Jackie, as I hear you and, and interact with you, is that you're naturally a very nurturing person. However, I hear that that really got freed up in this transition for you. That that the part of your heart that's so nurturing when you were driven uh, kind of got worn out, and you got worn out, and hmm. that the drivenness kind of lost people around you lost that sense of that nurture that you're naturally mm-hmm. there and that as you've made this transition it's it it more emanates from you like as you described the blessed mother the blessed mother's heart this kind of comes through you uh in all the ways in which that's healing by itself and so i i'm gathering that part of the healing is not just what you say to people and how you direct them but how they encounter you and the experience of that. Yeah, it's it, thank you. Um, it's um, all glory to God, and and truly, it's it's His presence. I think that's one thing. Um, it's being in His presence and receiving the Lord as as often as as possible um, to stay so so close. Uh, but really, this this renewed purpose, you know, this this is the gift. Um, I, I get so humbled and overwhelmed um, to think, like, why? Well, I, I, this is the mission He's placed in my heart, and I get, I get to, I get to be, you know, wild about mm-hmm. Jesus without being crazy. And this is so, I'm like, what a gift! This is so, and like, and I'm, and just to to express the love um, of Him and the love of this work uh, so freely. Um, that that was a really hard barrier to cross. And once I did Dr. Bob, it was so freeing because, of course, the St. Mary Magdalene in me was, uh, you know, I don't deserve this and I'm a right. sinner and, and how can this be? And um, I'm not worthy to carry out this mission. Um, but the Lord over and over again reminded me that it's actually Him through me. And in order for him to work through me, um, I had to be uh, open to him um, in every single area of my life. And that, you know, he very gently let me know that he didn't want just a part of me. He wanted all of me, just like he gave all of him, himself to us. And um, and that's really what we're asking people to, to do um, in reform is to give all of us to him and let him into all of our aspects of our health and all of the aspects of our, our healing. So, um, so yeah, this, this shift has happened because of, um, of the way that he's been able to uh, invite me um, to let him in to, to my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Jackie, about, uh, and, and this is something we can take out. I feel like we're at a crossroads and in some ways there's the opportunity to potentially press deeper in to the heart dynamics of you and what you see in leaders. And I'm also feeling the possibility of practicals about how potentially people would love, like, can you give us quick hitters in each one of those little uh, eight pillars or the nine? I'm not sure where to go. I'm not sure what direction. I guess, well, I'll say it differently. I would love to go in both directions, <laughs> but that would require probably three hours, which I, which is not what we signed up for. Um, so I, I'm just curious, like if you have on your heart a sense of where you think would be good to go, and I would love to go in either direction. Mm. I think what's on my heart is to share um, an invitation to leaders to expose their holes, um, and let Jesus Mm. into them. Um, I think that's something that, um, leaders struggle with is, is letting, um, Mm. letting the world and and the people that they lead, um, know that there are some, some holes and, and how to bring Jesus in. So I guess I'm, I'm in a duality too, because we could, we could do that, you know, through giving some best practices, but I I can do both easily. I think we can, we can be effective if, if you'd like. Yeah. Tell me, you're using this concept of um, 
holes. And I, th- I know exactly what you're meaning, but I want to translate for the listeners. Um, yeah. What do you mean by we all have holes, but in particular, leaders have these holes that they might be ashamed of? What do you mean there? Sure. So um, when I was first starting reform, uh, I was meeting with uh, Brother Colby, who I often say will be Saint, Saint Colby one day. Um, hmm. And he actually asked if we could meet at a different time, he said, Jackie, I can't meet with you today. I have, um, I have so many holes and I just, I'm not ready to expose them yet. And I like, I need to invite Jesus into them. Hmm. And I was thinking if brother Colby has holes, I don't even want to know how many holes I have. <laughs> Crater. So, so I, right, yeah. Yeah. So I, I yeah. went up to the chapel with him and just asked Jesus to reveal my holes too, thinking, wow, hmm. I've never even thought of that, you know, in that way. Uh, you know, hmm. you hear wounds, you hear trauma, you hear brokenness, but really right. like actual holes. Um, and I went to mass that night at St. Patrick's Cathedral and in mass when we hear, um, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, I was thinking of, um, the holes. And I thought, wow, it's when we expose our holes and invite the Lord in to make us whole, then we can be holy. Um, yeah. So I kind of like, you know, went on this, this uh, we call it the, the, the path of holiness at reform. Um, uh, but what we mean is, where are the places where you haven't gone before, where you haven't allowed the Lord to go, where you might feel broken? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you think about a, a house, it would be kind of like, where are the leaks, uh, in the roof? You know, yeah. where are the, where are the cracks, um, that, uh, that you're, you know, quickly maybe putting a, 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 a photo over on the wall. So your guests don't see it or, you know, throwing the mess into right. the closet. Um, but th- those places. And so when I say holes, I mean, um, areas that, uh, we've e- either hidden from the Lord, um, or that, uh, just are not of substance are not really of him in our lives. Right. Yeah. Could you share? Uh, a place of that in your own discovery for yourself and then how that translates into your work with others? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, let's go with Christ-centered. Um, a question I had to ask myself was, uh, is is Jesus really at the center of my life? And and if not, who or or what is? Um, and there were there have been many seasons of my life, even after conversion, where I thought Jesus was at the center or I wanted Jesus to be at the center. Um, but either something or someone w- took, took the center, whether that be reform, even uh, being at the center, right. w- you know, e- and again, thinking that it, it stemmed from a, a good place because there was good intent. Um, but, but still became God for me, uh, became, became the center. And Dr. Bob, the, the only way that really any of my holes have ever been filled is with raw humility. And just really bringing it to the Lord and and um, and acknowledging it and 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 asking Him uh, to to fill it. And um, it's usually after I've tried to fill it uh, myself and and um, and kind of wrestled with it for a while. Um, but uh, as you mentioned earlier, Jake, he he is so gentle, um, uh, but also firm and and strong uh, and yes. serious <laughs> and, and in a yes. beautiful way. Um, and, uh, and so I knew that this invitation to allow him to fill, uh, you know, holes along the way, whether really big gaping holes or, or small ones, um, each time has, has been like a, a time of pr- pruning, but also purification, um, mm-hmm. where he would use that to purify something even deeper that I didn't know was attached to that below the surface. Mm-hmm. Jackie, it's bringing up a concept for me around shame mm-hmm. and I imagine, I know this as a leader, right? Uh, people would look at, Bob and I are in similar domains. We're, we're speakers, we're, we work in the psychological realm. And I think an area for us is when we have psychological problems, it feels like it can disqualify you. <laughs> so you're now, you shouldn't be a leader maybe. And I think, you know, I know Bob quite well. I know he knows me quite well that we're fairly comfortable in that domain of of to use Paul's St. Paul's language boasting of our weaknesses and have learned that that's okay. And I I I imagine that, that for a lot of leaders I, I I'm you implied that earlier where it's hard to admit it because of the shame that like I'm a priest I should I should have a 3 hour holy hour every day because right. that you know or whatever and I'm only praying 3 minutes a day and I w- I would imagine for you even right what a bold thing that you're stepping out in because what it automatically does 
is everybody looks and assesses you. <laughs> well, are you doing it? That, isn't it? I mean, that's every leader's greatest fear. As soon as you get up front somewhere, you're instantly being evaluated based on your hypocrisy or not. And I know because you're a human being that you haven't always lived up to the to what you would maybe ask or whatever, or, you know, like you haven't always, you, you know, you've eaten a bag of potato chips at some point <laughs> when maybe reform goes, we don't do that or whatever, you know, I'm just curious, like, how have you processed through that as a leader? Because I think that's an Achilles heel mm. for a lot of folks. It's Can funny. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I saw a, uh, one of my friends and, and a priest from uh, our, our parish um, in, a gr- in a grocery store recently, and he nearly jumped over his cart <laughs> when he saw that I was in the you know grocery store with him so that I wouldn't see what was yeah. in his cart. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, there's no judgment like, here. Uh, I eat chocolate yeah. too. <laughs> you know, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it's a... It, uh, it's a blessing and a curse in a sense, because um, first of all, the blessing and the gift in it is that I have to walk this walk, you know, for me to to wow. do this well um, and authentically, um, you know, the, the joke would be on me if, if, you know, if I, if I wasn't really living this well. Yes. Um, and so actually it's quite freeing to have the responsibility to wow. live these, um, these pillars out well uh, to the best of my ability. And you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm very human. Um, yeah. and that's the, the thing is that, um, I think you have to constantly be healing. You have to constantly be reforming. Mm. Um, it's not, yeah. uh, you don't reach a destination, um, you know, and right. it is the journey. And I think that's what the world kind of falsely promises us is that like, here's the formula, here's the diet, here's the workout right. plan. Here's the thing that's going to, you know, here's the ticket that gets you to heaven and gets you the six pack. Um, but mm-hmm. You know, we we all, we laugh at reform and we say like Jesus is not going to ask you to show you his your your six pack. Um, show him <laughs> your six pack when you get to the gates. You know, right. he's going to look at, at at all of these things. And um, I'm constantly mm. reforming. You know, there's seasons where um, you know mm. my nutrition's really dialed in and my movements really dialed in, um, but stress needs some work. And there's other seasons where stress is really dialed in, um, mm. but my personal growth is is you know is is now needing some work. And so that's really where I, the elements of my humanity come to life is, and, and, and that's where the gift of sharing and being vulnerable really comes from is that as I'm reforming, I'm sharing my best practices and my learnings with the community and saying, guys, I'm, I'm actually right in this with you. I haven't figured yeah. all this out. I may have just started with some more awareness prior to, mm. to you, but yeah. I'm right next to you on, on this journey. Yeah. That's wow. good. Do you want to maybe now transition? Maybe I, I feel like if I'm listening to this episode, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Get to the stinking eight pillars. Tell me something I can go do, right? The controller doer in me is like, so could we just quickly go through them and you can maybe give us one little tidbit of whatever. And then I'd love to land the plane with just some some details about how people can, you know, go through all your, your contact points. But yeah. So faith, like I think that was the first one. Yeah. What's just a quick, give me something quick. So yeah, I can, yeah I, okay. I, we're, I'm just going to preface this with, I am going to communicate or over communicate basics here because when we know that we should be doing something, we think we should just skip to the next thing, but we're not oh, actually doing it. So I'm going to remind us of things that we so need good. to be doing as a foundation before we go to the next thing. Um, so praying every day for 30 minutes. Every single day, at least 30 minutes in prayer is going to keep Christ at the center of your life. So we can't awesome. have Christ-centered living without prayer. And at least 30 minutes um, out of 1,440 in a day, we just need to claim 30 of them for, for the Lord at the very least. So that's that's where mm-hmm. we're going to start with, with faith. Okay, cool. So for nutrition, um, one of the best practices is sitting down for your meals uh, for for about 20 minutes and chewing each bite. Uh, This is going to invite you uh, to be present with your food, um, to say grace, um, but to not eat on the go, um, but to really Uh digest uh, your food, digest the day thus far. Uh, digest your emotions and your feelings. Um, And so sitting with your meals for for at least 20 minutes and chewing each bite thoroughly. 
Uh, in fact, actually this morning, um, I'm on retreat and, and Father Elijah um, said to us, uh, I want you to go through your day very slowly. Chew each bite really slowly and do not pick up the fork until everything you have in your mouth is completely chewed and swallowed before you go to the next bite. Um, wow. And that's really hard to do. Really yeah, hard to do. Right. Yeah. I like the 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 vacuum approach is kind of more <laughs> my style, right? Like the, no. uh, Yeah. That's so good. R just really quickly, I heard this total random thought, but the, I want to go right back to it is somebody, one of my buddies is in the marketing world and he said that drive-throughs were actually created because of shame, not because of like convenience. It was like, I don't want to go inside and order six burgers. I want to order it in the shelter of my car or whatever. Wow. So I was like, whoa, that's fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I, I just, I'll, I'll just share where that stemmed from. I had a, a, a client who was a plus size model um, and she had tried every diet, had really struggled with food addiction. And when we started working together, she was one of my first clients and she said, um, you can't tell me what to eat. And I was thinking, okay, <laughs> this is going to okay, be a difficult yeah. nutrition client. <laughs> yeah. um, and right. then I said, okay, let's just focus on sitting down and chewing your food. You have to sit down for your meals for 20 minutes and, and just three meals a day. Right. Within one week, she bridged the gap between what her body wanted and needed together. So like what she wanted and what her body needed, she bridged the gap between because she no longer got to sit down and eat as fast as she could or binged because she had to eat slowly and she could only wow. eat at these three times. So the beginning, she ate food that, um, you know, maybe wasn't so good for her. And she realized right. she ate it really quickly and she had to sit there for another 16 minutes <laughs> after she then, you know, just binged. And then by the end of the week, she was wow. putting things on her plate that actually made her feel good that she wanted, but also needed. And, and it kept up, uh, still to, to this day. So, I mean, there's wow. a real psychological component to slowing down and being present to, to your food. Mm -hmm. Ah, super cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. This sleep. is fun. Yeah, next pillar. Sleep. Okay. <laughs> sleep is the next yeah. pillar. Um, and we'll do um, the uh, optimal times for sleep are between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. That means a sleep by 10, um, which means Ooh. that you want to unplug from all technology at least an hour before. So that is by 9 p.m. Um, which is usually uh -huh. when we start ramping up <laughs> um, yep. after work and and all uh, in the world. So um, so th we we at least want eight hours. That's not for children. Um, that's that's not uh, for okay. for adolescents. Um, that is for adults. Require at least eight hours. Uh, that is not um, that is not cool. a, a a tale. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Nice. Okay, for movement, um, we want you to move every day for 30 minutes in a way that glorifies God or that you truly enjoy, which will be the same thing. A way that you truly enjoy will, will glorify God. So, so like Bob could keep doing his Zumba classes because Bob loves some Zumba. He's a mean Zumba, I, right, Bob? I don't even know what Zumba is, Jake. <laughs> Uh, anyway, sorry. Okay. No, but but yes. So moving your body in a, for at least thirty minutes, and even do, do not discount stretching, walking, um, dancing. Um, there's there's so many different ways to move your your body. Awesome. Okay. I'm I'm I ha I know a couple that are coming, so I'm curious where you're going to go. Yeah. With these, so. Okay. So yeah. Uh, for community, um, we'll go there next, and that is um, to serve others or to ask for help as needed. And I think that's the biggest part of allowing others wow. to really know and see you is to either um, give the gift of self uh, in community or to be humble enough to say, I need help um, and ask others for help. I think that's the greatest wow. way to really connect with others in community because you are either serving or you're being vulnerable enough to say, I need to be served. That's good. Hmm. Cool. Uh, for personal growth, um, one of our best practices is uh, what we have already mentioned here, and that is reclaiming your primary purpose in Christ. Um, hmm. That changes everything because from there, then you can use your God-given talents and charisms um, to fill, fulfill your primary purpose. So if your primary purpose is a daughter of 
for son of Christ, then your secondary yeah. purpose is usually your vocation. Um, right. And that ha- that stems from your your primary purpose. So um, it's reclaiming that. And, and that's usually where so much uh, pivots is, is that um, when we reclaim that truth uh, and, and even in our health, um, we, we're, we're growing right there. Very cool. Um, next we have, let's do space. Space is a pillar. Not very many people know yeah, about, this was um, one. Yeah. and it's because, uh, we don't really know what that looks like. Uh, we, when we say space, I mean like actual space, space in nature, um, wow. where you're getting outside and in, in like wide open space. Um, I mean, space away from world and, 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 uh, society in the sense of like some solitude. Um, and we also mean reclaiming the space, um, that you live in. So like really, um, having an intentional approach to, um, what's on your calendar, what's on your desk, uh, what's on your walls, um, like reclaiming the space around you. So, um, a best practice, uh, that we love for, for space is, um, I'm actually going to use uh, fasting, but not fasting in the way that we think from from food, um, but right. fasting from when I mentioned our health bank account earlier, fasting mm-hmm. from the things that take up space in our lives, fasting from the things that make us less healthy. So that wow. could be la- fasting from social media uh, or TV or profanity or judgment or any of the things that are, are life detracting. So to create more space in our life for Christ, we have to fast from the things that um, take up that space. Very cool. Where, where, how many do we have? Which ones are left? Uh, are we so done? let's see. Stress we left. have. We have stress. stress left. <laughs> we have stress. Okay, Doctor Bob. Stress. Right, let's get to let's get to stress. Easily okay. one of our reformers' favorite and the best practice for stress is implementing a daily. And a weekly Sabbath. So truly, I mean, it's a commandment to honor the Sabbath. Um, okay. So truly living out the Sabbath and resting um, one full day a week. And in that same approach, resting for one full hour each day. So having a, an hour in the day, that's like a Sabbath where you're totally resting in the Lord and having one full day each week that you're you're resting as well. Wow. What what would you could you press into that? Because uh, the the doer in me is like, hold on a second, because <laughs> I can be shoveling while I'm resting, right? You know, <laughs> and obviously you don't mean that. What no. what do you mean like rest? Like, does it not watching TV? Is that count or how does that? Yeah, we ask you to not rest with technology if possible. Um, there's still some stimulation going on there, and okay. um, when I say rest, I mean either you know laying on a hammock, um, le- you know uh, sitting down for for prayer. We say don't you know? There's this phrase that says don't just sit there, do something. We say, don't just do something, sit there. Um, and that's uh, kind of what we mean by a daily Sabbath. And so it can be used for a time of prayer, certainly, um, but passive prayer, prayer where you're just, you're resting and allowing um, very passively for for uh, the Lord to uh, to be with you and, and to be in, in prayer. So it could also be um, some sort of a, a re- relaxing sort of hobby, let's say, like um, whether you're drawing or, um, okay. uh, yeah, or, you know, a garden gardening, uh, but, but not for, like with, with a purpose, uh, kind of playfully or, or restfully partaking in something. That sounds like, I think maybe my motorcycle riding could be <laughs> that one because it's, that's very much rest for me. Yeah. That's but great. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Reading fit into rest. Yeah. Reading. And, and I think, um, yes, certainly Dr. Bob, but I think also not academic reading and not even really deep spiritual reading. Um, huh. and I think in the same hand, also not like too too far off in, in fantasy land reading, right? But just the, like light content um, and and uplifting, certainly. Yeah, that's good. So play is the wow. next one. Yeah, play, and we. Uh, I think my favorite one to share is how you can playfully surrender your day to the Lord. And so this is one I learned mm-hmm. from my spiritual director, Sister Agnes Day. She um, she's a sister of life, and she would say. Mm-hmm. You know, I I remember my first meeting with her ever. I said, you know, sister, you know, here's here's everything I I really want to work on our our work together. And I'm thinking, roll up my sleeve. She's going to hand me a plan. Like we're, we're going to let's get yeah. this show on the road here. And she listened to me for about 45 minutes, and she just looked at me and she goes, "What is Jesus going to do about this?" And I'm like, "No, no, no. What are you going to do about this?" <laughs> Right. Um, and, right. Uh, but then it really gave me this beautiful invitation to say, wait, wow, I get to playfully give 
all of this over to Jesus, uh, not seriously, wow. but playfully. playfully. Like, what are you going to do about this? Like, this is this is exciting. This is an opportunity. Um, even the things that didn't feel so exciting or that didn't feel like an opportunity. So that's the that's the in, intention and the invitation because a lot of times we didn't play as children. So sometimes trying to recreate childhood fun is is difficult. Um, but we get to recreate that by being playful with uh, our our work and our our prayer life. Yeah, just to share with you, one of the most beautiful things about our bishops' conference is every evening we would play together, our team and the bishops, and it it absolutely transformed the week. It was the best. Uh, I love that. Yeah, it was it was just beautiful, and and we all became equal in the play, and it, just the the conversation and the laughter, and it, it just really transformed the week, which was very intense otherwise. But that's very true. It was really beautiful. I wish I would have said I ate slowly, though, when dinner time was finished. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the play was there. <laughs> so good. That's so, so good. good. That's so good. I think we've hit well, them all. That I I just want to, like, biggest shout out. I don't, you know, obviously listeners, like, check this out. Like, this is so cool. There's so, I, I love the... I, I, again, I want to redeem the word holistic. Mm -hmm. You know, this is truly holistic. And really what I'm hearing you say, which I think is my final point, and then Bob, I'll pass it over to you, is I really see reform operating with a really solid anthropology. And good anthropology fuels good healing. It's why we started this podcast with theology of the body, because if you don't have a good anthropology, it's very hard to move forward in healing. And I'm really hearing the solid anthropology in reform. And so I'm just, I'm super excited and I, I'm so glad for what you are doing and all your team is doing for the church and the world. It's, it's just awesome. So, so cool. Bob, what, final thoughts? Yeah, just uh, appreciation, Jackie, for who you are and for what you're doing. And it's been a delight having this time. And hopefully there'll be other opportunities to, to get to know each other better. But I, I'm grateful that the the part of the church that hasn't heard about what you're doing can hear. And uh, mostly you offer classes. Is that right? Uh, that people can sign up for as their also individual appointments with with practitioners. Yeah, thank you both so much uh, for this invitation and opportunity. And yes, we have a we have an online course that everybody starts with called Reform Online, and it's twelve weeks. Um, and in that, you also have the opportunity to consult one on one with um, with a member of our team. Um, and we work in human formation uh, and also functional medicine. So there's different pathways you can take there. Um, and then after that, we have, after you go through the foundations of reform online, you can work, you continue your work one-on-one uh, -on -one with a practitioner if, you, if you'd like, um, or we have a group consulting class called Dig to the Roots. And that's where we dig to the roots of your spiritual and physical um, well-being. Uh, it's kind of like the next layer after, after that. So, but we have memberships in a really amazing uh, community. Um, so, but it does, it starts with reform online and, and that's uh, where we invite everybody to start. And would people, is the best place to start in the sense of just getting to know more about you and signing up? Is that reformwellness.co? Yes, it is. And we um, we also share a, a ton of free content on our so social media. So um, on Instagram at reform underscore wellness, um, we share lots of uh, educational material and Very prayer cool. reflections and um, a place to to come and, and dive into um health with a new lens of body and soul together. Wow. Jackie, this has been an absolute privilege. Matt, God bless you. Uh, this is so cool. We're very grateful. And I look forward to having you back at some point to dive more into all these other areas and domains. It's it's so good. Thank you. God bless you. And listeners, we really want to encourage you to check all of this out. Um, lots of cool stuff there uh, that really, I think, blends well with what Bob and I are doing and really rounds out a lot of the stuff that Bob and I don't have a clue about. So that's really awesome. Um, so you can check out Jackie again at reformwellness.co and you can get all the contact information there. And um, we'll continue on with the series uh, with, a, with some more leaders next time. But until then, God bless you. 